Hello, and welcome to this presentation about accessory dwelling units in Moorhead City. My name is Chad Meadows, and I've been asked by the town to assist with the exploration of new regulations for accessory dwelling units in the town. This is a copy of a presentation that was made to the public on May 4th of 2023 in Town Hall. So accessory dwelling units are an important trend in land use across the country um, in the face of high inflation, uh, robust residential demand, the housing supply crisis that we have here in North Carolina and nationally, um, issues uh, holding over from the pandemic, uh, specifically the work from home phenomenon and the ability for people to work from home uh, and move to uh, their second homes or, uh, or vacation homes uh, full time is definitely having an impact on uh, the availability of residential supply. We have an aging population, uh, folks who would like to remain in their communities um, and need uh, have different housing needs. Uh, there's also changing preferences, millennials and, and others who are seeking um, different living arrangements than what we've seen maybe through the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. Also, uh, we've got an active General Assembly who has been um, preparing a variety of new legislation for many topics related to housing, not least of which is accessory dwelling units. So tonight we are going to talk a little bit more about the accessory dwelling units themselves, some potential standards that the town might be considering, and this presentation will uh, overview for you the work that has been done to this point. So first, we'll have an introduction. I'll give you a little bit of detail about code right. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what accessory dwelling units are uh, and some benefits and concerns associated with these kinds of land uses. We'll talk a little bit more about this project's history, uh, the town's current standards for in-law regulations and pending legislation at the General Assembly related to accessory dwelling units. In the third part of the presentation, I will go over some of the proposed accessory dwelling unit standards that are under consideration now. Now, nothing's been um, proposed. We're not in a text amendment at this point, uh, just an exploration stage, uh, which was the purpose for the uh, public meeting back on the 4th of May uh, and is the reason for this presentation. Finally, I'll talk about next steps, um, other aspects that uh, residents in town might wanna consider with respect to accessory dwelling units and, and where we go from here. So uh, as I mentioned before, my name is Chad Meadows um, and I am an urban planner. I am principal of Code Right Planners. Um, it's a small consultancy in Durham, North Carolina. We work solely for local governments, uh, preparing development codes and comprehensive plans. Uh, Code Right was founded in 2014, though I have been a public or private sector land use planner since about 1992, so for about the last 30 years. I also work as the legislative chair for the North Carolina Planners Trade Group, the uh, North Carolina chapter of the American Planning Association, and I serve as the Board of Adjustment Chair uh, in the community where I live uh, in Durham. As I mentioned, I'm helping uh, Moorhead City explore some new regulations for accessory dwelling units based on my experience drafting these kinds of standards for similar resort communities. So what is an accessory dwelling unit? Um, this graphic uh, is from the AARP and it gives a quick sort of overview of what exactly accessory dwelling units are. You see six different kinds of configurations here. The principal structure, the, the main residence, if you will, is, is shown in blue. Uh, and the accessory dwelling unit is shown in an orange color. And what the graphic shows is that there's a variety of different ways that accessory dwelling units uh, might be accommodated on a lot with an existing home. It could be detached from the home or attached. It could be inside. Uh, it could be in the basement or it could be above a garage. So a variety of different ways to accommodate accessory dwelling units. What are these things? Well, they're independent, self-contained residential dwellings. They provide spaces for cooking, sanitation, and sleeping for the residents who live there. 
They're typically located on a lot that already contains an existing single family detached dwelling. The accessory dwelling unit itself is subordinate in size, function, and impact to the principal structure. And again, accessory dwelling units can be detached, attached, um, or within the principal structure. So what are some of the benefits of having accessory dwelling units? Um, Moorhead City does not currently permit accessory dwelling units. If the town chose to permit these kinds of uses, then you could expect a variety of benefits to accrue, um, including wider housing options for residents. The folks who live in Moorhead City would have a wider range of residential use types to choose from. Uh, families could accommodate the needs of other family members, uh, an aging parent, uh, a sibling, um, a, re a child returning from college, uh, someone in need of medical care, etc. So an ability to accommodate additional family members fairly easily. The ability to age in place. Perhaps um, a resident might not need uh, a large principal dwelling anymore. A smaller structure might be sufficient to meet their needs uh, and they can stay in their home um, in a smaller structure. Certainly passive revenue, um, the ability of a homeowner to rent an accessory dwelling unit to an unrelated family member uh, is certainly a major benefit, as is the increase in resale value uh, from the inclusion of an additional dwelling unit on the property. Accessory dwelling units uh, are a very efficient use of land. In other words, they help us conserve the available land in the community by locating additional residential dwelling units on lots that are already developed, lots that are already served by infrastructure. Having accessory dwelling units helps ensure full employment. It creates opportunities for folks who work in the community to be able to afford to live there as well. Uh, and then finally, just more housing options in general creates the, uh, the effect of keeping rental costs affordable for everyone. So lots and lots of benefits that, that can accrue uh, from these use types. At the same time, there are also potential concerns with accessory dwelling units. Like what? Well, certainly additional traffic um, and parking in residential neighborhoods can result from standards that permit these kinds of structures to be constructed. We all worry about noisy neighbors and the loss of privacy that might come from having an additional dwelling unit in the backyard. There's a potential for increased stormwater runoff. The, these are uh, impervious surfaces with roofs um, and rainwater doesn't absorb in, in and tap into uh, accessory dwelling units. So there is the potential for increased stormwater runoff. Infrastructure capacity concerns. Um, folks who live in accessory dwelling units use water, use sewer, um, and so infrastructure capacity is affected uh, by these kinds of facilities. Often there's a lack of design control with respect to these structures. The image uh, that you see on the screen would be an example of an accessory dwelling unit that maybe wasn't as attractive as, as it could have been. Um, so there is a potential for uh, lack of design control and resulting structures in the community that, that aren't as beautiful as maybe they could be. Certainly for landowners who choose to locate an accessory dwelling unit on their lot, there is a loss of yard space. Uh, and then finally, there is increased property tax. The inclusion of an additional dwelling unit on property will result in higher property taxes uh, for that landowner. So. With all of the benefits, there are some potential concerns. So development regulations for accessory dwelling units, they seek to balance the benefits against the potential concerns. So let's talk a little bit more about this, the background for this accessory dwelling unit regulation project. So the initial call for study uh, for accessory dwelling units was actually initiated by Downtown Moorhead City Incorporated way back in 2017. Uh, that group was concerned about a lack of affordable housing throughout town, not just for seasonal employees, but also for residents who live in the community. And so they expressed their concerns to the town council. Um, essentially, the next step was that a research, uh, research was conducted and a text amendment was prepared by a special town planning subcommittee back in 2017. There was a joint work session with the planning board and downtown Moorhead City to review the text amendments in February of 2018. 
and the text amendment consideration went on to the planning board as is customary for text amendments also in February of 2018. Now when this was before the planning board uh, there were concerns expressed during that meeting about density, lot coverage, parking impacts, stormwater, emergency access associated with accessory dwelling units. And those concerns caused ADUs, accessory dwelling units, to be removed from the text amendment. At that time, the planning board did approve the inclusion of multifamily development in downtown, but chose to suggest staff conduct additional research uh, on the accessory dwelling unit issue before coming forward with new regulations. Fast forward to June of 2021, the town council did adopt a set of standards for in-law quarters. I'll talk more about those in a moment. Um, at that time, city council directed staff to further explore accessory dwelling units. Um, the city staff reported its findings, its research findings, to uh, the planning committee in early 2022. Um, in October of 2022, Code Right was contracted uh, to begin to assist the town in exploring these standards, and we had an initial meeting with the town's planning committee in January of 2023. So, in-law quarters. Um, these are the closest thing that Moorhead City has to accessory dwelling units. So, these provisions um, are called in-law quarters. It's basically a self-contained dwelling unit within a permitted structure um, that's inhabited by no more than two people related to the principal occupant uh, in the main house. Um, in-law quarters are self-contained dwelling units, um, and they are in addition to the principal structure. So there's a handful of standards that apply to these uses. Um, for example, they're only permitted on lots in the R20 district that are 10 acres in size or larger. Um, these 10 acre lots can only be permitted to have one set of or a single in-law quarters residence on the lot. Um, there has to be an existing principal home. Um, the in-law quarters can be attached or detached from the principal home. Again, only two people or up to two people can live in the in-law quarters and they must be related to the house's occupant. Um, the in-law quarters can occupy up to 30% of the size of the principal house and cannot be rented separately from the principal home structure. So. June of 2021, these standards were adopted by Moorhead City and have been in place since. Now there's some pending legislation. Uh, the General Assembly is the body that controls development regulations for local governments uh, across the state. And there are a couple bills uh, pending in the General Assembly now that relate to accessory dwelling units. Now these bills are still draft bills. Um, as of May 4th, 2023. That could change uh, if they're adopted by the General Assembly. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about these two bills. The first is House Bill 409. Um, it stipulates that an accessory dwelling unit has to be allowed uh, on every lot that's zoned for residential use in all local governments in North Carolina. Um, also, the bill allows accessory dwelling units to be built before, during, or after the principal house uh, is built. That's a little unique in that accessory dwelling units typically may only be established after uh, a principal home has been established on a lot. The bill require or clarifies that um, no local government may adopt standards that require the owner uh, of the lot to reside in the principal or accessory dwelling unit on the lot. So those kinds of standards would not be permitted if House Bill 409 were to pass. Also, House Bill 409 bars local governments from applying parking standards to these kinds of uses. Um, there are some provisions for setbacks, specifically that no local government can have a setback requirement that exceeds 10 feet from any lot line for an accessory dwelling unit. So an accessory dwelling unit could be no closer uh, than 10 feet from a lot line, but there are no requirements that uh, could remain that would uh, require that accessory dwelling unit to be farther than 10 feet from the lot line. Finally, the bill does not invalidate covenants against accessory dwelling units. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will see a link to uh, this bill, House Bill 409. 
I'll also talk a little bit about House Bill 474. This bill recognizes a kind of residential form called small housing. Now, small housing is any residential unit of up to 800 square feet in size. And this bill stipulates that any small housing, whether it's an accessory dwelling unit, a tiny home, or a single family detached home, that that home be permitted on any lot in a residential or mixed use zoning district. Uh, there is no principal house required, so you could establish this as an accessory dwelling unit without a principal house on the same lot. Um, the accessory dwelling unit does need to be on its own foundation and does need to be connected to utilities such as electricity, water, sewer, etc. Um, as with House Bill 409, House Bill 474 does not invalidate any covenants. Uh, that bar accessory dwelling units, and neither bill requires um, local governments to accommodate accessory dwelling units in historic, uh, in historic districts. So that is the rundown on the pending legislation. Again, these two bills are still just that, pending legislation. Um, if they do pass the General Assembly, then um, whatever is in the bill will be uh, become a requirement for Moorhead City, and any regulations um, that are adopted will not be permitted to be in contrary uh, to the bills that are passed. So this is an important issue, um, and it's important for the, the town to begin to think about how, uh, if and how, it will attempt to regulate accessory dwelling units uh, going forward in the future. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the proposed accessory dwelling unit text amendment. And again, I'll just clarify that the language that has been assembled is simply for review purposes. There is no pending text amendment um, in play. Um, the town is exploring the possibility of new standards. If the town determines that preparation of new accessory dwelling unit standards is appropriate, then the town will follow the state mandated process for amending the unified development ordinance. There will be a meeting with the planning board to consider the proposed regulations. That will be followed by a public hearing with town council. Both of those meetings are uh, open to the public and will be advertised. So plenty of opportunity uh, for folks to get involved and share their opinions about draft standards. Uh, for now, We've got um, some, a proposal, uh, 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 some ideas about how to regulate accessory dwelling units, and I'd like to talk with you about those now. We'll start with definitions. So the proposal defines an accessory dwelling unit as a separate or distinct residential dwelling uh, or housekeeping unit that is located either internal to a fully detached either internal to or fully detached from a principal single family dwelling. It's important to note also that an accessory dwelling unit is a complete residential dwelling or housekeeping unit. Now, on the right hand side of the screen, you see a series of seven terms. Each of those would be defined. I just read you the definition for the accessory dwelling unit. The second term is an illegal accessory dwelling unit. That's an ADU that does not have a zoning permit. Um, zoning permits would be required and accessory dwelling units that did not have a zoning permit uh, would be considered illegal. There's a definition of an internal accessory dwelling unit. In other words, one that is inside an existing single family detached home and a detached accessory dwelling unit, one that is outside of or not attached to an existing single family home. Number five is an important definition, complete residential dwelling or housekeeping unit. All accessory dwelling units must be a complete residential dwelling or housekeeping unit. That's a structure that's primarily devoted to residential occupancy that complies with all of the applicable requirements for a dwelling for human habitation in the North Carolina Building Code. And uh, it's a structure that contains its own kitchen, its own bathroom facilities for sanitation and washing, and its own sleeping areas. This proposal includes a definition for conditioned space. That's habitable floor space that is climate controlled and intended for human occupancy located within either a principal or accessory structure. Finally, there is a definition of a short-term rental, which 
is a complete residential dwelling or housekeeping unit available for rent to members of the general public who may agree to occupy the residential dwelling or housekeeping unit for an agreed upon period of time of less than 30 days for a fee. Now, this proposal has nothing to do with short-term rentals, and I will clarify for you that as proposed now, accessory dwelling units don't permit short-term rentals. However, that's an issue for further community discussion. We'll talk more about that in a moment. This slide is uh, an excerpt of the use table, the principal use table in the town's unified development ordinance. And so the use table is a tool used by the town to identify the different zoning districts in the community, which are shown across the top of the table, along with the different kinds of uses that are permitted by the unified development ordinance. Those are shown down the side. So this table includes accessory building slash use, the accessory dwelling unit detached, the accessory dwelling unit internal, and dwelling single family detached. So those are the uses um, that are contemplated here in this text amendment change. Across the top, you see R5, R5S, R7, R10, etc. Those are the residential, uh, the zoning districts that are available in Moorhead City. Now, inside the matrix, you see a, a series of P's and S's. Any use that has a P, uh, that denotes a, that that particular use is permitted by right. So for example, accessory buildings are permitted by right in R5 and R5S and R7, etc. across the table. Likewise, dwelling single family detached, that's a basic single family home. Um, and you see the districts where it's permitted, uh, primarily the residential districts, as well as the office and professional, the plan development, uh, and a couple of the downtown districts, CD and DB. Um, there, you see some S's. S's are, uh, mean that it requires approval of a special use permit for a single family detached dwelling to locate in O and P, CD, or DB. So, that is the process by which you would establish a home uh, in the districts. This information that's shown in black ink is provided solely for information. There are no changes proposed to either the accessory building slash use standards or the dwelling single family detached standards. Where additional changes are suggested are shown in red or blue. In red, we see accessory dwelling unit detached, accessory dwelling unit internal. And this table shows that this proposal would consider permitting internal accessory dwelling units in the R15, R15M, R15SM, R20, and PD zoning districts. Those internal dwelling units would be permitted with a special use permit in OMP, CD, and DB. Looking at the accessory dwelling unit detached row, we see that accessory dwelling units would require a special use permit in R15. In the R15M and R15SM, we actually see a S slash P. That denotes a situation where if the lot in the R15M or R15SM districts has 20,000 square feet or more, then a detached accessory dwelling unit could be permitted by right. If, in fact, the lot in those districts does not have 20,000 square feet of area, then a special use permit would be required. You see also the in-law quarters shown in blue. Ink that's shown in blue is proposed for deletion as part of this proposal. So the accessory dwelling unit standards are proposed to replace the in-law quarter standards. So let's talk about some of the general standards that are applicable to any accessory dwelling unit, whether it's internal or detached. Three kinds of standards here. There's the establishment standards, the operation standards, and the configuration standards. So I'll just step through these quickly. Um, any accessory dwelling unit uh, requires the approval of a zoning permit. The proposed standards also indicate that an accessory dwelling unit can only be permitted as an accessory to a principal single family detached dwelling that's used solely for residential purposes. The only uses that can have an ADU are existing single family detached homes. 
No more than one accessory dwelling unit per, is permitted per lot, and the accessory dwelling unit must be, must be on the same lot as the principal home that it serves. In terms of operational standards, accessory dwelling units cannot be subdivided, sold, or separated from the principal home. They need to utilize a separate street address or house number, which needs to be visible uh, from the street. And if in the instance where uh, the lot is not served by public water or sewer, then the ability to establish an accessory dwelling unit requires proof of capacity uh, for on-site wastewater and on-site potable water services to be able to serve both the principal dwelling unit as well as the accessory dwelling unit. Configuration standards. Um, <clears throat> accessory dwelling units obviously have to comply with the applicable floodplain rules. They need to be a complete residential dwelling or housekeeping unit. In other words, they have to have facilities for cooking, sanitation, and sleeping, and they need to meet the minimum building code requirements for room size and ceiling height. Accessory dwelling units are subject to the same setbacks that would be applied to the principal structure. So if the principal house has a 20 foot wide front yard and a 10 foot wide side yard, so too must the accessory dwelling unit. The condition space cannot exceed 35% of the condition space in the principal house. Remember, condition space is floor area that is subject to climate control. An accessory dwelling unit may not take place as part of a manufactured home or a recreational vehicle. Uh, each accessory dwelling unit must have at least one dedicated off-street parking space, and the unit must have separate electrical, HVAC, water, sewer, and natural gas service from the principal structure. So those are the basic standards for an accessory dwelling unit. There are a couple of other provisions depending upon whether or not you are internal or detached. But I'd like to take a minute and explain some things that accessory dwelling units are not or how they're distinguished from other kinds of residential use types. So for example, um, an accessory dwelling unit is not a principal house because it can only be established on a lot after a single family detached dwelling is established on the same lot. An ADU is not a multifamily unit. Um, <clears throat> it can only be established as an accessory use to a single family detached dwelling. It's not a condo. It's not a townhouse. Um, it's not on its own lot and can't be sold apart from the principal structure. An accessory dwelling unit is not a home occupation. It's not a commercial occupation, profession, or activity as defined in the current Unified Development Ordinance. It's not a business residence. A business residence is limited to one dwelling unit, uh, and it takes place in a building that is not a single family dwelling used solely for residential purposes. An accessory dwelling unit is not a duplex. It may not be on its own lot. Uh, it must be smaller than the principal house, and it may not be sold separately. And finally, an accessory dwelling unit is not a boarding house or bed and breakfast room. Uh, a boarding house or bed and breakfast room is not a complete residential dwelling or housekeeping unit. So it's important to make these distinctions so that people understand exactly what an accessory dwelling unit is and is not. So I mentioned earlier there's some additional standards for detached accessory dwelling units. So a detached accessory dwelling unit is one that's established on the same lot as a principal single-family dwelling, but is clearly separate. It's a separate structure uh, detached from that principal single-family detached dwelling. Now, it could be its own structure, or it could be part of another accessory structure, like a detached garage. So an accessory dwelling unit that's detached may not be located between the principal house and a street abutting a front or side lot line for the lot where the principal house is located. I mentioned earlier that detached accessory dwelling units in the R15M and R15SM districts on lots that are smaller than um, 20,000 square feet in size need to obtain a special use permit in order to be approved. The accessory dwelling unit may be no taller than the maximum building height for the zoning district or the height of the principal house, whichever is less. 
Further, the accessory dwell the detached accessory dwelling unit cannot exceed one story. It can be located on a second floor, such as above a garage, um, or elevated above the floodplain. And if it is, that is acceptable, provided um, the total overall height um, is less than the zoning district or the height of the principal structure. Finally, if a detached accessory dwelling unit is located on the ground floor, uh, then it needs to be at least 10 feet of physical separation between the principal house and the accessory dwelling unit. There's a few standards for internal accessory dwelling units. Remember, these are accessory dwelling units that are established within the perimeter walls and roof of an existing single family residential dwelling unit. So the first standard is that the internal ADU must be located within the outer extents of the exterior walls and roof of the principal dwelling. You may not use a breezeway or other non-conditioned space to connect an internal accessory dwelling unit to a principal dwelling unit. And finally, uh, an internal accessory dwelling unit needs to either one, share a principal interest, entrance that also serves the principal dwelling, or two, be accessed by an entrance located on a separate building facade than the primary entrance serving the principal structure. So those are the standards. Um, at this point, we've talked about um, the, the accessory dwelling unit benefits and concerns. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the project history. Uh, we've covered the definitions. We've talked about the zoning districts where these things might be accommodated. We've talked about some of the general standards that would be applied to either an internal or detached accessory dwelling unit. We've talked about what isn't an accessory dwelling unit. And then finally, we've covered um, some additional standards that would be applied whether you were a detached or an internal accessory dwelling unit. So there are a few other factors to consider um, as the town thinks about how these regulations might be incorporated into the UDO. So on the screen are three topic areas or questions for consideration that still need deliberation and discussion. The current draft proposal does not include any provisions that relate to these three topics, uh, pending additional discussion with the community, with the planning committee, and perhaps the elected officials. So the first of these is how we would go about preventing illegal conversion into an accessory dwelling unit. And what that means is if someone got approval to build an accessory structure, uh, a detached garage, a pool house, a studio, a shed, what have you, um, is there a concern about that accessory structure being subsequently illegally converted into an accessory dwelling unit? Well, potentially. Um, there are different standards for uh, accessory dwelling units, different setbacks, different height requirements, uh, different utility requirements, etc. cetera. Um, so there are some safety concerns with respect to illegal conversion. Most of the time, illegal conversions take place without benefit of a building permit, and that's obviously a public safety consideration. There's compatibility issues. Uh, there are setback, height, and other kinds of provisions that are intended to help ensure compatibility of accessory dwelling units with their surrounding uh, neighbors. And if one does not get a permit, then one could potentially be in violation of setbacks, heights, or permissible zoning districts, which would be a compatibility issue. And then finally, the enforcement resource challenge. Um, it would be very difficult for the town um, to, to go out and check every single existing accessory dwelling unit to make sure that it had not been converted um, illegally to an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, and that would be expensive and keep their attention diverted from many of the other things that they're expected to, uh, to enforce. So what are some options? Well, <clears throat> the town could require all habitable accessory structures to meet the accessory dwelling unit requirements in terms of setback, um, in terms of height, um, in terms of permissible zoning districts. 
Another option is a require an annual permit renewal for habitable, in other words, accessory dwelling structures, accessory structures that could be entered into that had a door um, and that people could go into to require an annual permit renewal for these structures if they're not compliant with the accessory dwelling unit standards. Another possibility is to significantly increase the civil penalties for violations if someone were to illegally convert an accessory structure into an accessory dwelling unit, raising the civil penalties associated with that illegal conversion might help prevent that owner from making that choice. Finally, another choice is to simply not worry about it. So a variety of options for further discussion in terms of illegal conversion. The next question is what to do about existing illegal accessory dwelling units. Um, it's no secret that there are existing accessory dwelling units in Moorhead City. Um, they are illegal. Um, there is no permit approval for an accessory dwelling unit, so it could not have been established legally. Um, I mentioned earlier that the process contemplated by these standards requires approval of a zoning permit. Enforcement will be also be a challenge here. Um, as with illegal conversion, um, enforcement of this kind of standard will require staff to go out and find existing illegal accessory dwelling units, not just those that exist today, but those that might be converted um, or operated at some point in the future. Is there political will? Uh, is there the political will on the part of the town to go in and address these existing illegal accessory dwelling units? Finally, there's some statutes of limitations about the town's ability to enforce its regulations against existing illegal accessory dwelling units. Depending upon how the town found out about their existence, the town has between five and seven years to bring an enforcement action against an illegal accessory dwelling unit. So a variety of issues uh, to consider. Um, some options for how we might address these. Um, we could mandate um, permits and initiate enforcement actions um, for illegal ADUs, um, accessory dwelling units that cannot meet the standards. In other words, they don't meet the setbacks or they're too tall or they're in a district that doesn't permit them. Um, so enforcement in immediately is an option. Another option is an amortization period, uh, perhaps three years. Uh, and then um, after that three year period expires, um, it would be the town would expect those uh, owning Ill existing illegal accessory dwelling units to abandon those uses um, and, and stop, uh, stop pursuing that activity. Another option, um, as opposed to immediate enforcement or a delayed three-year enforcement, would be an amnesty program. Um, an amnesty program would allow existing accessory dwelling units, even though they're illegal, uh, to remain um, as non-conforming units, provided the landowners come into the town uh, and attempt to secure a permit for that existing illegal accessory dwelling unit. If that's done, then they have created non-conforming status for that existing accessory dwelling unit, um, grandfathering it in, if you will, um, and allowing it to stay until um, it's abandoned or casualty damage takes place. Finally, um, we could simply just not worry about it uh, and not pursue any sort of enforcement action against existing illegal accessory dwelling units. Um, if you have some opinions about what the town should do, um, then please do go to the town's webpage uh, and fill out a comment card with your thoughts um, about what the town should be doing about these issues. Finally, short-term rentals. Should accessory dwelling units um, permit short-term rentals? Certainly there's impacts to neighbors. Um, allowing accessory dwelling units to be occupied by temporary residents or guests uh, pulls those uh, dwelling units out of the community's housing supply, making it harder for folks who live here uh, to find a house. 
um, certainly impacts to infrastructure, transportation, water, sewer, etc. Um, also some impacts to the tourist economy. Um, if short-term rentals are not permitted as accessory dwelling units, does that have an impact on the town's lifeblood? Um, these are important questions to be thought through. Um, in terms of some options here, um, you know, one option would be to prohibit short-term rental uh, in accessory dwelling units outright, or prohibit it in only some places, um, or establish a permit for a short-term rental, um, either in an existing single-family principal home or an accessory dwelling unit. Um, limit short-term rentals to specific locations in town. Um, apply additional development standards uh, to the uh, to the short-term rental of a principal home or an accessory dwelling unit. Or finally, like the others, uh, and depending upon your stance, um, perhaps the best thing for the town to do is simply not worry about it and let these things take place. So next steps, where do we go from here? Um, we'd like to collect your input. Um, this presentation was given on May 4th of 2023, and there were comment cards available um, in the room at the time. Um, if you're watching this, then that presentation has already taken place. However, there are comment cards available on the town's webpage, or you can simply um, reach out to the town and provide your information to the planning staff. Um, once we are um, done with input collection, which will basically wrap up on May 19th of 2023, uh, town staff and I will review uh, the information that we've received. We will revise the proposed ADU text amendment that I've gone over tonight. Um, we'll basically synthesize what we heard um, and add options or revise based on the information that we received. The next step for us is to discuss uh, the accessory dwelling unit standards as revised with the planning committee. Um, if revisions are called for uh, and those are made, then we will return to the planning committee and discuss it um, and determine or attempt to determine if the planning committee wishes to move forward with accessory dwelling unit standards or uh, if it wishes to, to not move forward. Um, should the planning committee decide that it wants to move forward with preparation of some standards, we will begin the formal text amendment process. Um, and that includes the um, advertisement of public meetings and hearings, um, the conducting of a meeting with the planning board, and a public hearing with the city council. Certainly in each one of those instances, um, residents and interested individuals could attend those meetings and would be given an opportunity to speak. So that's essentially where we go from here. Um, please do send us your comments by May 19th. Um, there is a copy of the draft standards available on the town's webpage. Uh, I am Chad Meadows and I thank you again for watching this video and for sharing your views on accessory dwelling units. I look forward to hearing from you uh, and seeing you as this process moves forward.